Good afternoon once again. My name is Heather Nielsen and I'll be acting as your host for today's webinar from Major Lindsay in Africa entitled Roadmap to Relocation, focusing on the Bay, the Bay Area. Thank you very much for joining us and taking time out of your day. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, you should all be able to see my screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. The phone lines, however, are muted, and although all of you can hear me, we cannot hear you. That said, you can still ask us questions, and we encourage you to do so. At the top right of your screen is the GoToWebinar panel. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit Submit. My colleague, Kat, will be monitoring the Q&A for later in the broadcast. Today's webinar will be approximately 45 minutes, with 30 minutes of content, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Rest assured, if we don't get to your question during the live broadcast, we will respond offline via an email. Lastly, we're recording the call uh, for this webinar, and it will be available to you within 48 hours. We will provide a link to the on-demand webinar for all those in attendance, as well as those who couldn't join us. Before I turn this over to my colleagues, Kate and Summer, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what we're going to cover. We will be covering reasons to relocate to the Bay Area, the relocation process, why to enlist an expert, how to choose a recruiter, practice areas that transition well, the credentials of successful candidates, the firms doing the most relocations, the California bar, relocation packages, law firm versus in-house roles, living in the Bay Area, and as I mentioned, a Q&A at the end. With that said, and without further ado, let me turn this to over to my colleagues, Summer and Kate, for their introductions. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, my name is Summer Eberhard, and I'm a managing director at Major Lindsay in Africa, where I specialize in associate recruiting for the San Francisco, Palo Alto, Portland, and Seattle markets. I began my career practicing law for several years and then transitioned to legal recruiting in 2013. In that time, I have placed over 70 attorneys into AMLAW 100 firms, boutiques, and in-house with 19 of those being relocations from within the United States as well as overseas. Last year, I placed 17 associates and council level attorneys in the Bay Area at a variety of firms. This includes Sidley Austin, Shepard Mullen, Mofo, Wilson Sonsini, Oric, Davis Polk, as well as some boutique firms. I have a candidate first and relationship focused approach assisting associates in making moves that make sense only with their long term goals. Good morning, my name is Kate Rader Shake and I sit in our San Francisco office. I was a litigator in the Bay Area for almost a decade before I fell into recruiting while living abroad. I've been a recruiter since 2015. I have been with MLA since the summer of 2017 and am solely focused on the Bay Area. I have relocated associates across borders and state lines. I made 21 placements in 2018 after my return from maternity leave last March. I recruit very much in opposition to the way that I was recruited when I was a lawyer. Uh, for me, this isn't sales. It's very much about building long-term relationships with lawyers that I like and respect. If you'll read my reviews on LinkedIn, it'll give you a good idea, idea of how I do this job. My colleague Summer and I are delighted to speak to you today. We will be trading off, so I will be speaking on every other slide, and I will start off on the first one. So first, I want to tell you that we have a lot of talented lawyers in the Bay Area, but we simply don't have enough boots on the ground. I regularly talk to clients who ask me to find them relocation candidates. I was recently meeting with an M&A team, and they specifically asked for candidates who are currently in other jurisdictions. For a lot of practices, there simply aren't enough associates to do all of the work at all of the firms. It's been an incredibly intense and competitive market for firms. They're genuinely fighting over associates. There truly is a better lifestyle in the Bay Area. It's much less of a FaceTime culture. I used to be a recruiter in London, which is totally a work hard, play hard environment. And by that, I mean there are a lot of team visits to the pub. This really isn't the same model. It's about getting your work done, then going to do whatever it is that feeds you. People often move to the Bay Area because of the easy access to mountains and beach. Everyone from associate to partner has interests outside of work and their days involve a lot less heavy drinking together. The weather difference is real. There is no polar vortex here. It can genuinely impact your mood. I recently spoke with a candidate that I just relocated to the Bay Area from New York. 
And she was raving about the fact that she was walking down the street in February in just a long sleeved shirt. It's a total paradigm shift. As I said, we just don't have enough boots on the ground here. IP, corporate, litigation, tech transactions, both in high tech and life sciences. These practices are so hot that people are able to make big leaps up in prestige by coming out here. One example is capital markets. Straight out of law school, associates who are excited about capital markets probably go to New York rather than San Francisco, and that's totally understandable. But that means that there isn't enough indigenous talent here. As a result, a candidate from another market will have his or her pick of firms. I don't think that there is more sophisticated tech-facing work elsewhere in the U.S., period. The tech revolution is happening here, and so is its legal work. If you want to be doing high-level work for Twitter, Google, Facebook, Apple, Lyft, Uber, Pinterest, Airbnb, it's all on offer here. Once you're at a firm out here, you're suddenly a viable, strong candidate for some of the sexiest in-house gigs. If you want to go in-house, especially to a major tech client, coming from a Bay Area-based firm is a great head start. We'll discuss that more later. I'm going to talk a little bit about the recruiting process. Over the course of my recruiting career, as I previously mentioned, I have relocated numerous associates across the country as well as from overseas. Despite the numerous relocations I have done, I didn't have a true appreciation of everything that went into relocating until my husband and I relocated from California a couple of years ago after having our first child. It was then that I realized how overwhelming and time-consuming relocation can be. This gave me a completely different perspective when working with associates looking to accomplish the same goal. Based on my experience, knowing what to expect is something that can help ease some of the anxiety that comes with such a big decision. For attorneys, the most important part of that process is to enlist the right recruiter. This means finding someone who has developed expertise and relationships in the Bay Area. There are many recruiters that cover the nation and they simply cannot provide you with the level of understanding necessary for you to achieve the most success in your job search. I will talk about this in greater detail later in our presentation. Once you've enlisted the right person, they will help you identify which firms fit what you are looking for, and they can help you start the, submitting your, the process of submitting your materials. From there, your background will hopefully generate interest, which will then turn into interviews. The interview process usually consists of one or two phone screens or video conferences from your home market, followed by a full round in the Bay Area. I should note that your recruiter should try to leverage a full round trip with other firms you've applied to and try to set up multiple meetings while you are in town. Oftentimes, a firm that wasn't as eager to pull the trigger on the initial screen may suddenly be willing to take a meeting once they know you will already be in town. I also know that as a lawyer, your free time is already limited. So maximizing your time is incredibly helpful, especially if you are looking at a cross country move. Your interviews will hopefully translate into one or more offers, and from there, your recruiter can help with negotiating a potential signing bonus, which is not always a given, but it never hurts to ask, your start date, and anything else that may, pop, that may come up. Once negotiations are complete and you've accepted your offer, you will start the conflicts process. This may or may not include a background check and references. Conflicts typically takes about one to two weeks unless something more complex pops up. After you pass with hopefully flying colors, you would give your firm two weeks notice and then plan for your move. It is fairly standard for a firm to expect you to be in the seat four to six weeks after you give notice. This equates to two to four weeks for the notice period and for your move, followed by about one to two weeks of time off. Unless absolutely necessary, I always recommend taking a little time to yourself. It is, it is not often that an attorney has absolutely no work responsibilities or emails to answer to. As Summer said, relocating can be a lot of work. In 2017, I moved from London to San Francisco to take this job while I was six months pregnant. I started at this job, bought a car and a house, and had my son within about three months. There were a lot of moving pieces. When I've helped people relocate, which I've done many times, I help with literally everything. I help candidates pick a neighborhood, select a moving company. 
I am a San Francisco native, so I know the city and the rest of the Bay Area like the back of my hand. Associates are super busy, and I'm happy to take this off their plate to the extent I can, or just be a sounding board. An expert connected recruiter can help get you to the front of the line. I can't think of many firms where my word or summers doesn't go a long way. Yesterday, I had a call with a hiring manager. She had said that they were passing on one of my candidates and I convinced her to reconsider. If she didn't know me and trust me, this candidacy would be done. Self-submissions often go into a black hole and associates who work at the firm who might put your resume forward are generally not very keyed into the recruiting process. They have a job to do and it isn't managing your interviews. Recruiters can guide you through the process of figuring out which firms are the right fit based on your long-term goals. Keep in mind that a firm's office in a different jurisdiction may be completely opposite of what you find in the Bay Area in regards to clients, office culture, etc. You may have a strong opinion about what it's like at Latham because of their DC office, but the Bay Area offices are completely different. There's even a wide variation in some cases between the San Francisco and Palo Alto offices of the very same firm. A recruiter can help you if things get complicated with conflicts, i.e. if you have to get a waiver. A good recruiter is hands-on about helping you resign, talking you through how to navigate your notice period, which can be sticky. I give a pep talk to nervous candidates, and I think and hope that it helps. A good recruiter likely has access to needs that are not publicly posted. Summer and I usually have a handful of exclusive roles at any given time. It's hugely important to choose a recruiter who is an expert in the local market that you're looking to move to. Recruiters who are not familiar with the market are just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. I often step into these situations after someone has had their resume sprayed across town by a remote recruiter who doesn't know the hiring managers. It's not a good look. As I previously mentioned, picking the right recruiter in the Bay Area is incredibly important in the success of your search. Ideally, you want to find someone who has a deep understanding and truly specializes in the Bay Area as well as as a person that you will work well with. To find the right person, I suggest setting up a call and asking a lot of questions. You want to go through a thorough vetting process as this will save you time down the road. Ask detailed questions about the Bay Area, firms that align with your goals, other attorneys they have relocated to the Bay Area, which firms have better practices and why, etc. Your goal with this questioning is to vet out if they are truly an expert or trying to play it off that they are. In your call, you also want to make sure that you are compatible. You will likely be spending a lot of time talking with this person, and they will also be representing you in the market. Are you comfortable that they will be your biggest cheerleader? Did they make the conversation about you? Or are you already annoyed by their style? Prior to my current role, I recall talking with a recruiter that called me about a position. I started asking her questions and realized that she honestly knew nothing about the role and even worse, nothing about my industry. She started the, off the conversation talking about herself and telling me about the position before she even had an understanding of what I was looking for. There are so many times that I start talking with someone, and what I initially called them about is clearly a terrible fit. The right recruiter will listen and adjust their approach based on your goals. Another key question is whether this person has the experience and relationships necessary to be effective for you. This becomes important to make sure your submissions are paid attention to, that the person will have insider knowledge of the opportunities and the groups, the firm's recruiting process, what flexibility they may offer in regards to relocating, or even a potential signing bonus. Experience also includes having eyes and ears in the market. There are so many times that I see an associate change firms on LinkedIn, and my first thought is, how did they get talked into going there? As I know, the environment is terrible, or the firm is about to lose a key set of partners. The only people who are going to have this information are recruiters whose practices specialize in that particular market. As we are in a global workplace, know that this doesn't necessarily mean they have to have boots on the ground. One of our most talented recruiters that handles the Southern California market has been and has been for almost a decade, sits in New York as she relocated with her family a few years ago, a few years ago from California. The only way to know for sure is to have a quality conversation and to ask the right questions. 
What does this all mean? You want to avoid using recruiters who work all over the country or what seems to be every major market. As each region has its own unique footprint, it is simply impossible to have the expertise and personal relationships with every firm and every partner in the country. Recruiters trying to service the country are often trying to leverage the relationships they have in their own market, but know that law firms generally have regional, if not local people that handle each office. You also want to avoid recruiters who seem to be using the kitchen sink approach and suggest submitting your resume everywhere or to opportunities that don't match your background or class year. This approach can reflect poorly on you as a candidate and potentially decrease your chances of success. Ideally, you want someone who has experience with your background, expertise in the market, is connected with the firms you are interested in, and has a thoughtful candidate first approach. This is the recipe for success. I get this question about uh, what practice areas transition well all the time. Um, candidates who are in other locations ask me, does my practice even exist in San Francisco? Would I be a viable candidate given my experience? These first two categories, corporate and IP, are generally the areas where we simply don't have enough talent on the ground, even though we have quite a bit. It's easy in these two categories to, to move without the bar. Candidates are in such high demand that not being barred generally isn't going to be a consideration for firms. I mentioned capital markets as a space where we have a real dearth of associates simply because San Francisco isn't the typical destination for associates who want to do capital markets when they're starting out. In M&A, we have a lot of talent and it still isn't enough. An M&A associate will have a ton of options. If you're someone doing ECBC work in, the, in another jurisdiction and want to go where the action is, we would certainly love to talk to you. There is a smaller but vibrant funds practice in the Bay Area and some very high quality firms who are super thirsty for more associates. Among them are Kirkland and Goodwin. Technology transaction associates are in super high demand. So if you have a life sciences background or an EE or CS degree and have been doing something different but arguably, arguably related, i.e. broad corporate or IP lit, firms here would be very receptive to you as a tech trans associate. The main industries for corporate generally and tech trans especially are life sciences and high tech. Also, if you're a broad corporate associate and want to move into ECBC, that transition can definitely happen. As an example, I currently have an IP lit candidate from another market applying to transition into technology transactions and also move to California in one fell swoop. If you're looking for a total change, it can definitely happen. If you're a litigator like I was, it may be a touch trickier to come to California without the bar, unless you're very well credentialed. But either Summer or I would be able to tell you having looked at your resume whether you'd need to take the bar before applying. Litigation roles in the Bay Area tend to be either broad commercial, IP, securities, or white collar. There are definitely roles for other niches like insurance, defense, tax, and some antitrust but those searches may take a bit longer simply because there are fewer live roles. Privacy is very, very hot right now. I just placed a candidate at Baker McKenzie where there wasn't a role. Both on the more counseling and transactional side and on the litigation side, this is a very active market. For the last category, there are just fewer roles. But I will say that I recently moved a trust and estates associate from New York to San Francisco where there wasn't a live role. They interviewed her based on her impressive credentials and are literally building a new office space for her in San Francisco. So a really talented, impressive candidate can often get this done even if there isn't a live role. So don't get discouraged. I started off my career in Southern California and when I transitioned to Northern California, there was one stark difference. The Bay Area is one of the most competitive markets in the country and firms are extraordinarily picky when it comes to academic and law firm credentials. This is even more the case when it comes to associates looking to relocate to the area since it is generally much more costly than finding someone local. The most desired profile that firms are looking for are attorneys that graduated from top 20 schools or were top of their class from a first tiered school, has some big firm experience or at least has worked on some pretty highly sophisticated cases or deals, 
and is experienced in the role that you're applying for. There are exceptions to these restrictive requirements. This includes opportunities in hot practice areas like corporate and IP, as well as positions at some boutiques and mid-sized firms. It is important to note that if you are outside the scope of these credentials, it is not that you cannot find a position. Just be prepared that your search may take a little bit longer. The Bay Area is also not a market that is keen on retooling associates. Firms generally will hire attorneys that have the requisite experience of the role they are looking to fill. There are exceptions when an attorney's experience can be leveraged into a different role. Kate brought up that a good example of this is an IP litigator transitioning into a technology transactions position. Many attorneys often ask whether there is a need to have a California connection. In my experience, the answer is no. Unlike smaller markets where personal connections tend to be a little bit more important, many people transition to the Bay Area simply because of career opportunity and it being a desirable place to live. Bay Area firms, in particular, are extremely used to seeing associates' resumes from all over the country and are more than comfortable hiring a well-credentialed associate from another market without any reason other than that they wanted a change of scenery. I should note that the Bay Area market is tight, and as firms begin to accept that the high caliber of associates they are targeting are becoming increasingly difficult to find, as we truly have a supply and demand issue, they will hopefully begin to let up a little on their credentials expectations. The firms doing the most relocations tend to be the biggest, most established firms that are willing to pay for a relocation and also hold on while the candidate takes the bar. It's a bit harder for a small boutique to stomach this, both the weight and the financial outlay. Firms that come to mind as being particularly practiced at relocations are Wilson Sonsini, Goodwin Proctor, Perkins Cooey, Kirkland, Fenwick, Oric, Gunderson, Mofo. But that's not an exhaustive list. And for the right candidates, firms really will bend over backwards in this market. I also want to point out here that some of our most actively hiring firms may not be massively on your radar in your jurisdiction. The candidate that I just moved out to Perkins Coie from New York would probably not have considered their New York office as being a major player. But her practice is very vibrant here and the firm is a very big player in the Bay Area. This point about roles that have been open for a long time is huge. I have someone from a smaller firm in a smaller market interviewing with some of the biggest names in the Bay Area in part because she's great, but in part because these roles have been nearly impossible to fill with local talent. Law firm's credential consciousness, as Summer said, does sometimes tend to go down when they have a role that's been teething for a while. One of the most significant barriers to entry into the Bay Area and California in general is the bar exam. California not only has the most difficult bar exam in the country, but it does not offer reciprocity for any other jurisdictions. To practice in California, you have to take and pass the bar exam, complete the moral character application, and pass the MPRE exam. I should note that the moral character application can take more than six months to complete. I recall filling out my own application in February of 2009, and when it came when it was time to get sworn in it come December, it still wasn't complete. The bar exam itself is two days unless you qualify to take the attorney's exam, which is one day. The exam is offered twice a year in February and July with results coming in May and November. If you want additional information, you can check out the CalBar website, which goes into great detail. As I mentioned, the bar exam is one of the biggest hurdles for attorneys wanting to relocate is hiring someone who is not barred is potentially a huge risk for firms. Law firms are generally more flexible on the bar requirement for certain practice areas such as corporate and IP. Other practices such as litigation and employment law tend to be much more difficult to transition. This is partly because of the bar issue along with the practices being much more state specific. That all said, there are two factors to watch as to whether the California bar is going to continue being a barrier or if firms are going to be more willing to forego the requirement. First, the bar exam transitioned from a three-day to a two-day exam in 2017. Consequently, the exam now has less room for error. The results of the July 2018 bar exam were the worst California has seen in decades. 
While firms haven't yet made any adjustments, if this trend continues, we may see the bar exam become an even bigger barrier as firms may be less willing to take the risk. On the other hand, as we've mentioned, the Bay Area is incredibly tight, and the number of attorneys to fill the number of opportunities is becoming less and less. As firms become more desperate to fill their needs, they may, be more, they may become more flexible in regards to the bar requirement. In the end, only time will tell, but the bar exam does continue to be one of the biggest barriers to entry into the California legal market. This is one of the first questions I get from candidates who are interested in relocating. Basically, how does this work? Who pays for what? Firms tend to have pretty strict policies about what a relocation package looks like, though there's occasionally some wiggle room. Summer and I can give you the lay of the land when we get to offer stage. Any AMLAW 100 firm is going to pay for your Themis or Barbary course and for the test itself. Time off definitely matters. I recently got an extra week for a candidate to study. This is another benefit of working with a recruiter. We are long-term advocates for you before and after acceptance. A standard package can vary from basically you expensing the move to your firm to being given a fixed amount. That fixed amount may be well more than you need to move. One of my candidates recently used some of the money to furnish her new apartment. Like we keep saying, if you're landing into a role that they've been trying to fill for a long time, you may have more latitude to make requests. And rest assured, these are conversations that we are very used to having on your behalf. This is one place where it can be pretty nice to have an ex-litigator on your team. There may be tax implications to a move across state lines, so that's something you'll want to discuss with an accountant as it's outside the purview of our expertise. It seems that every associate I talk with these days wants to know about in-house opportunities. As this is one of the most common questions I get from attorneys looking to transition into the Bay Area, I think it is important to note some of the key factors as the Bay Area is truly unique in the in-house space. The Bay Area continues to be one of the most vibrant and growing markets in the country in a variety of industries, but predominantly in the technology sector. Because of the unique characteristics of the tech industry, there are more companies popping up in the Bay Area than anywhere else in the country. This leads to one of the most vibrant in-house legal markets. Because of this trend, the competition to go in-house for even local associates is fierce. This results in companies truly having their pick of the litter. Since companies don't have to settle, they tend to recruit associates from local firms who have worked with clients in a similar industry. One of the unique attributes of Bay Area firms is that they are incredibly active in assisting their associates in going in-house. For example, I recently posted an article on my LinkedIn about Oric's internal job board, which provides their associates opportunities with clients. Bay Area firms understand that not everyone wants to make partner, and so they provide their associates the tools to meet the goal of an in-house job by providing access and hands-on experience. Because of this unique landscape, the most effective way to go in-house really is to go to a firm first. It gives you the opportunity for success, will provide you with many more options once you are in a position to start your search, and which will hopefully lead to your perfect in-house role. I should also note that timing is everything. More and more, junior associates are asking me about in-house opportunities. While in-house is a great option down the road, transitioning too early can potentially close doors, and the opportunity to have significant training and mentorship may be more limited. While it is not impossible to go in-house from outside the market, it is definitely a much more challenging way to go. More often than not, these associates come back to us months later because they have still not found success. It's no secret that it's not cheap to live here. As I mentioned, I'm a San Francisco native and I've watched it change with the tech revolution. There's definitely sticker shock if you're coming from a market where there's a lower cost of living. Many firms are offering signing bonuses to make up for this. There are also pockets of the Bay Area, such as Oakland, where it's less expensive. It really comes down to the lifestyle that you're looking for. The commute between Palo Alto and San Francisco is doable, but not necessarily fun unless you live near Caltrain and enjoy that kind of transit. So the decision between the two locations is significant. They really are two separate markets that happen to be co-located. 
Palo Alto is sunnier, warmer, smaller, and much more driving focused. It's effectively suburban. San Francisco is colder, bigger, faster, and you can easily live here without a car. If you're living in a big city right now and want to change, Palo Alto may be for you. If you're looking for a faster pace and a more bustling environment, you definitely want to be in San Francisco. When I meet associates in San Francisco, they invariably meet me on foot, whereas when I meet associates in Palo Alto, they drive from their offices. It's just a very different lifestyle. It comes down to whether you want restaurants and grocery stores within walking distance, or you'd rather be able to drive and easily park. I personally live in San Francisco and walk to work, and I'm just not a Silicon Valley person. I love the fog and being in the middle of the action. But one of my candidates said she cannot imagine living and working in San Francisco. She is Palo Alto for life. The point is, they are very different. For whatever reason, there are more general litigation roles in San Francisco than Palo Alto, and a lot of corporate roles, especially ECVC and Tectrans in Palo Alto, which makes sense. IP tends to be centered in Palo Alto, but there are still many roles in San Francisco at the moment as well. M&A and capital markets tend to be more city or San Francisco practices, but that's not to say that you can't find what you want in either location. Just a note that you're a strong contender for in-house roles down the line, whether you're in San Francisco or Palo Alto. In-house roles seem to be agnostic about location once you're in the Bay Area. So you don't have a leg up by sitting in one office or the other. Just being in the Bay Area is the major step. I wanna note that everybody that I have helped relocate to the Bay Area is still here and thriving. And I'd highly recommend coming to visit and seeing it for yourself. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Kate and Summer, for breaking down everything you need to know about relocating to the Bay Area. While I give everyone a few minutes to type in your questions, I'd like to plug the next two cities in our roadmap series. First, on April 17th, join Katie Weaver and Amy Monroe as they discuss the Texas legal market. And next, on June 12th, Rebecca Glatzer will discuss relocating to Atlanta. We will return again in the fall to cover several other hot cities. So um, if you haven't already and you do have some questions, please type them in um, to the console. Um, if we don't get through them all, um, Kate and Summer will reply to you directly. The first question I have is for Kate. Uh, when should I start relocating if I want to move this summer? And Kate, if you can also address just at the end of that question, generally how long should you um, bookmark or you know, put aside to relocate in general? So I think Summer touched on this a little bit, um, but generally, if you want to look to relocate this summer, I would definitely start having the conversation now. Um, that doesn't mean that we would necessarily put in applications immediately, but I think we probably would want to put in applications in the month of March um, and get full round set up for April, which gives you time to decide and give notice. Um, the process, I would say on the whole, can take about six weeks. Um, again, it does depend on your practice area. So if you're, for instance, an IP litigator who are in super duper high demand in the Bay Area right now, um, you know, that process can move really quickly because firms are very motivated. Same with corporate. Whereas, uh, you know, this trust in the state's private client associate that I just relocated, that process took quite a long time because there wasn't a live role and they were actually had to make a business case to hire her, which they did. So it, it can vary between practice areas, but I would definitely say you would want to have a conversation with either, either me or Summer in the coming weeks. Great. Thank you, Kate. Summer, this one's for you. Um, I am a first year associate. When is the best time for me to start looking to relocate? That's a great question. Um, class year definitely can make a difference. Um, when you are relatively junior, um, if you are 2018, for example, the ideal time to start looking when firms are kind of open to bringing on 2018s is typically, you know, towards mid to late summer. Um, as many of you know, first years just started with their firms, and so firms are kind of figuring out and adjusting to see, you know, whether or not they have the resources that they need. Um, and by about the end of the summer, they definitely kind of figure that out. Um, you know, once it kind of comes down to towards the end of the year, they're definitely very, very open to uh, first year associates. Um, I should also note that just in general, 
The ideal time to relocate is really when you're a true mid-level, so about three to five years out. Um, it does tend to be the time where you will have the most number of opportunities to consider. Great. Um, Kate, this one's for you. My guess is because you mentioned you have relocated yourself from another country. So um, we got this question that says, I want to move to the Bay Area from another country. How can you help me with this? So the answer is we can. Um, the current administration's policies on visas are more stringent than prior administrations. So that is causing um, to be there to be a little bit of a slowdown. But we are seeing that firms are getting creative about how to do this. So I recently had a candidate um, from the UK interviewing in San Francisco. And if he were to, were to have gotten an offer, what they were going to do was have him sit in the London office until they could transfer him on on the company visa rather than an individual visa. Um, one thing that can be done in the process is to negotiate for some kind of guarantee about sponsorship for a green card down the line. So that's another place where it's nice to have somebody like me or Summer um, on your team to help have those difficult uh, and thorny conversations with the hiring folks. I also recommend if you're looking seriously at a firm to set up a call with their immigration counsel as things get quite serious, um, i.e. after offer stage to discuss what the firm is gonna do, are they gonna offer you expedited processing, these sorts of things. So in summary, it is possible to move to the Bay Area from another country, especially if you have one of our most sought after skill sets. Uh, you will have to take the California bar and the visa is probably the stickiest issue at this point, but we'd be right here with you to work it out. Well, we're going to go along the same lines, not quite London or overseas, but this person's in Cleveland, and they want to know if you will do relocations from that market or a small market such as Cleveland. Absolutely. Um, I have a candidate from Atlanta interviewing in the Bay Area right now. Uh, there's, there is no reason if you have solid experience, if you are a litigator, if you have been second chairing and taking depositions, if you have the sort of lawyerly dirt under your fingernails, there's no reason that you can't relocate from a smaller market. You, from a smaller market, I should note that you will have a uh, significant sticker shock looking at the cost of living in the Bay Area. But do note, um, if you're popping onto Zillow or the like, that uh, you, you will be paid uh, the, the requisite amount in order to, to find this to be a perfectly lovely place to live. So the salaries are raised commensurate with the uh, fact of the cost of living. Um, so yes, a smaller market, you absolutely can relocate if you have the skills and especially if you're well credentialed. If you went to a very local law school um, in, in the place where you are currently practicing and uh, are not do not have a skill set that's in high demand, it may be a touch harder, but we'd certainly love to talk to you and see if there's a way to get it done. Thank you, Kate. Okay, Summer, here... Um, I'm a securitization attorney, and there doesn't seem to be many opportunities. What options might I have in the Bay Area? Uh, that's also a really great question, um, and I actually recently dealt with this. I was working with a securitization attorney not that long ago, um, and it is definitely not a practice that there are a ton of opportunities in the Bay Area. Um, that said, you know, one of the things that Kate and I can do for you is we can chat with you, we can review your resume, and kind of look at what does your experience entail. Um, this particular candidate that I was working with also had a lot of experience in the real estate space, and so we were able to market him a lot to some of the real estate positions in the Bay Area, and we were able to find success. Um, and so this really does depend on kind of what your overall experience is. Um, and taking a look at, you know, what that is would definitely be helpful in identifying what roles might actually fit. Great. Um, Summer, wow, let's stay with you for another question, because um, you had talked about going in-house. What's the best way to do this? As I kind of mentioned, um, you know, in-house in, in -house is a little bit different. Um, it's one of those situations where, you know, you kind of want to look at, uh, options both through recruiters as well as on your own. As I mentioned, the best way to go in-house really is to go from a firm. 
just because so many of the firms in the Bay Area really do set you up for success to find internal roles at in-house positions. Um, I think outside of that, looking at, um, you know, the types of roles that you want to potentially look at, and you can definitely try uh, to get positions while you are, um, you know, in another geography. But as, again, the best way to do this really is to go from a firm first. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, let's see. Kate, another question for you. Um, this person obviously isn't sure where they want to they look. They're thinking about San Francisco and New York. How can you help with that type of search where they're not quite sure which uh, locale is best for them? So we do this all the time, and the answer is that in that uh, sort of case, I partner with one of my colleagues in whatever the other jurisdiction is. So I currently have a search running right now where the candidate is currently in New York and would move out here for the right role, but may also stay in New York. So I'm partnering with my colleague, one of my colleagues in New York. And he and I are running a side-by-side -side search. And what that means is um, we are occasionally applying to the same firm in both locations, but we're doing that in a completely uh, clarified way. So we're being completely upfront. If, you know, if, for instance, we're applying to Fenwick in New York and San Francisco, we are telling the hiring manager in both places that the candidate would be happy to sit in either location. And what this does, you know, if you're working with a recruiter from a different company in one location and a recruiter from MLA in San Francisco, it's a lot more difficult and risky uh, in that you know, if, if you apply in New York via that person and that person does not mention that you're also applying in San Francisco, you run the risk of looking very discombobulated. Whereas running an in, uh, a side-by-side -side search with all the same company, uh, my colleague in the other location and I are able to run it in a seamless way such that it's all above board, everybody knows what's going on, and there's no risk of you looking like you don't have your ducks in a row. Great, and I promise everybody we would keep it to about 45 minutes. So I've got one last question for um, Summer. Can you just go over again what types of firms and what firms you work with, you guys generally work with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the unique characteristics about Major Lindsay in Africa is really, um, you know, the reputation we have in the community as well as kind of the breadth of reach. Because of this, you know, we really do have, you know, quote unquote, an institutional clients um, with almost every major law firm that is out there, as well as a lot of the higher end boutiques and mid-sized firms. Um, so we really do kind of work with everybody. The best way to really, you know, figure out whether or not we work with folks that make sense for your background is to reach out to us and we can kind of talk about that further. Great. Thank you again for joining us all today. Special thanks to my colleagues, Kate Rader Shake and Summer Eberhard. Uh, please look for our email tomorrow with a link to the on demand webinar and as well as the survey. And if you are interested in other locales like Texas or Atlanta or some of our other cities, please um, look to other dates in our webinar series. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.